couldn't God just forgive sinners without the cross? We saw that God turned away his wrath sometimes in the Old Testament just with repentance. So what is the deal? And there's been different responses in church history. You might be surprised to know that Augustine and Aquinas both thought that the incarnation and death of Christ weren't absolutely necessary for salvation. What they did say was that God freely chose this way, the cross and atonement, as the most appropriate way of achieving our salvation. They agree with that. So we're, they're, not, they're not disagreeing. They're just saying it wasn't ne- they didn't think it was necessary. And then we have a lot more, Origen, Anselm, Luther, Calvin, that they believe that Christ's incarnation and atoning death were indeed necessary for our salvation and that divine justice is an essential part of God's nature. So, you, you know, if you, if you were talking to Alvin, you could bring out the fact that God did turn away his wrath in different ways in the, in the Old Testament, but not now, because Paul says now everyone needs to come to uh, him through Christ's atonement. So it's no longer this passing over of, of forbearance of sins in the past. So the next objection is penal substitution is unjust because God is punishing an innocent person, right? Jesus is sinless, and he's being punished. So first of all, we can say, well, wait a minute. Some some substitution theorists and penal substitution theorists don't affirm that Christ was punished. They would rather say... Christ voluntarily endured the suffering that would have been ours, our punishment, had it been on us. So he's enduring the suffering that would have been our punishment. That's how they would say it if they, if, if they didn't believe in um, that Christ was actually punished. But... Uh, in, in like in Anselm's satisfaction theory, Christ, is satisfied, Christ satisfies God's justice by compensation, paying our debt, not by enduring punishment. That's not, what he, that's not what he was about. But remember, the reformers had an answer for this. And it's not, it, it's not that it made Christ sinful, remember, but our sin was imputed to Christ, so he's legally blameworthy before God, and he can take our our punishment in that regard, okay? So does that make sense? So the imputation is important. And also in our own courts, vicarious liability exists in human legal systems where an employer can be liable for employees' wrongdoing. So that could be ways you could help someone get over this idea that... um, God is punishing an innocent person. The third objection is, if satisfaction of divine justice through punishment is a precondition of God's pardon and salvation for us, how is divine justice satisfied when the person who committed the wrong isn't punished? Right? So if we're, we're, we still committed all the sin, but we're not punished. How is that how is that satisfying divine justice? Well, this is where the representative part comes in. Christ is our representative substitute by means of his incarnation, so that by his death, he satisfies the demands of divine justice on our behalf. So the union of humanity with Christ is the basis of our sins being imputed to him and his righteousness imputed to us. So we can say... We can say, when he's punished, we're punished by proxy. Okay, and number four is, the cross is unjust because punishing Christ is like cosmic child abuse. Have you ever heard that? No? No? (laughs) Well, first of all, this is a terrible caricature, but God doesn't hate sinners. But you can see how maybe people might get that idea. Um, have you heard a real fiery preacher say that God is angry with everyone and, and that's why Christ came? But 
First of all, it's not God hated the world, so he killed his only one and only son. Because what does John 3.16 say? God loved the world, right? So that, that can't be right. Uh, Jet? But who cursed the ground and stuff? Well, what, what, the, way I, the way I would say it is he's angry because he loves people and sin destroys us. So God hates what sin does to us. And I just feel like we need to steer clear of rhetoric that implies that God is an angry father who poured out his wrath on his unwilling, um, innocent son. That's not a good care. That's not a good explanation of, of the atonement. So I think you're re- you're better to say that God God's wrath is on sin, and his hate he's hating sin, and what sin does to us. Um, John Calvin said. The father was, in fact, not angry at or hostile to the son at the crucifixion, even if in the midst of his suffering it may have felt that way to Jesus. That's in the Institutes. But there's a need to clarify Christology on this one, I feel like. Um, Because Christ wasn't merely human. The second person of the Trinity voluntarily took on human nature and gave his life for us. So far from being child abuse, it's a demonstration of God's love that the second person of the Trinity would condescend to take full, the full force of sin on himself to redeem us. So it's not that Christ was an unwilling, innocent son. He was very willing and in sync with the will of the Father in, in giving himself. So last one. So if Christ suffered the punishment that was due for all men, doesn't this imply universal salvation? So Christ's atoning death potentially accomplished the redemption of all men, but this redemption is actualized throughout history when persons come to be united with Christ through repentance and faith. Um, So to become beneficiaries of Christ's atonement, we must be united with Christ That's the identity with Christ, united with Christ, right? Um, Through faith and baptism, whereby we identify with his death and resurrection. It's only insofar as we are in Christ that his sacrifice on our behalf becomes efficacious.